Alors, merci de vous asseoir. On va essayer de, de commencer pour ne pas prendre trop de retard. If you could, if you could sit uh, so that we could start uh, right away. Uh, thank you for being here. It's, uh, it's going to be a great session, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, we uh, will talk about uh, the world economy, of course, the state of, uh, of the world economy, and, and also... Um, and also uh, governance, uh, which is, of course, a key issue uh, uh, for, the, for the coming uh, months and years. Uh, and uh, for, uh, for this discussion, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, a great panel, uh, I would say, with Henri de Castre, who is uh, one of the finest uh, French CEOs with truly global views on, on, on the world economy and, and also strong views on what uh, all countries uh, like, uh, like France need to do to, uh, in order to uh, uh, adapt to the new realities of the world. Uh, Kemal Dervish, uh, he doesn't need any introduction as well, but he's a former uh, Minister of Economy in his country, in, in Turkey, and one of the uh, leading figures of uh, social democracy in, in Europe and in, in, in the world, I would say. Uh, and, and also he's now uh, Vice President, of course, of uh, Brookings Institution. Jacob Frankel, uh, a central banker, uh, who, who will be able to talk about finance and all the challenges that, we, uh, that we're facing in, uh, in, in this respect. Uh, Pascal Lamy, uh, who, of course, uh, is uh, the um, former uh, general manager of the um, WTO and and also a leading figure of a social democracy, I would say. Uh, David uh, de Rothschild, um, of course, uh, the president of uh, Rothschild Bank. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Sakong uh, from uh, South Korea, also a former uh, economy minister uh, in his country. And uh, 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 we all remember that uh, he was uh, one of the key persons uh, in charge of organizing the G20 in, in Seoul uh, uh, a while ago. Um, just a few words uh, to frame the debate and then, uh, and then I, I, I'll give uh, the floor to, uh, to our panelists. Uh, a few words on, on the world economy because um, what we're seeing now is uh, a slight... Uh, acceleration of, uh, of world growth, that's uh, at least what is projected for next year, around something around 3.2%, maybe, maybe a little more, uh, and uh, that's an acceleration from, uh, from this year uh, that will end around 2.7% perhaps. I would just uh, state just a few points on, on uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, finishing year first. Uh, um, but it's, 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 of course, subject to discussion. But first, uh, we had financial shocks uh, reaching several big emerging economies uh, like India, like Turkey, uh, like Brazil, uh, Indonesia, and, and even South Africa. And all these economies combined uh, represent 12% of the world economy. So that's that's a, a significant event, event of, of, uh, of this year. Uh, another thing, another key feature of, of this year, I think, is China, because uh, one of the big questions a year ago was uh, whether or not China would, uh, China's growth would slow down. And in fact, uh, the Chinese economy is still uh, uh, quite strong, and uh, the projections for next year is... Uh, 7.5% uh, growth, 7.3% maybe. So it's still, uh, at least China has stopped decelerating, and that's a good news. The other good news, of course, is the US, uh, where uh, growth is, uh, is on a uh, good track, uh, probably around 2.5% next year. Japan, of course, is, is always a question mark, but uh, the uh, Abe economics uh, is at least uh, bringing some confidence in the Japanese economy, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, now, this country is also facing huge challenges, uh, especially financial challenges, as we all know. And then Europe, uh, and Europe is, is uh, at least, uh, the, uh, well, I would say there are two Europes, uh, one that is starting to grow again. Uh, uh, it's 
particularly the case of Germany, uh, projections for next year is around 1.7%. And then uh, the UK also is, is uh, rebounding. And then the rest of Europe, is, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, at least the Eurozone uh, has uh, come out of, uh, of the recession. That's the good news. But the bad news is that uh, growth is, isn't there yet. So uh, that's the, the, uh, the big picture, I would say. And then, um, there are, of course, many challenges uh, like, uh, I mean, the end of uh, uh, extremely uh, laxist monetary policy, and we, d we don't exactly know, but maybe some of the panelists here will have ideas on how we exit from, uh, from, these, uh, from these policies. Then, uh, uh, and then, of course, um, one point that I would uh, also um, single out is uh, whether or not the... Um, Big emerging countries I talked about uh, will be able to uh, uh, have a, a more balanced growth in, in the future. But of course, there are many, many other challenges facing the world economy. So let's start uh, start maybe um, uh, with you, uh, Kemal, uh, and if you could first perhaps give us a, a general picture of the, the state of the world economy as you see it. Well, you, you already started. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me make a few, a few points to get the discussion going, and I'm really happy to be here, and, uh, you know, and I really congratulate the World Policy Conference to, to always have these meetings. brings us together also with very good friends. The, the first point I'd like to make is that I'm an optimist in terms of medium to long-term growth in the world economy. There's a tendency now, and some very good brains are, are becoming quite, you know, quite pessimistic uh, Larry Summers, uh, you know, the, the, just a few days ago, uh, sent a rather pessimistic message on, on world growth. I think in the long run, the combination of technology that, that is still advancing very fast and also of continuing really large human needs. I mean, while there is a strong, thankfully, a strong world middle class now, there's still billions, three, four billion people who are very much uh, in poverty, not extreme poverty, but very poor. There is need for infrastructure investment, um, and, and, and there is technology. So I think the combination of all these things, if the macroeconomic balances are well managed, if the social political context is well managed, I think could allow the world to grow at three and a half, four percent for uh, two, three decades more. Then later on, you know, it's hard to say, of course. So I'm fundamental. I think the drivers, the medium term, and the drivers and sources of growth remain very strong. The second point I'd like, uh, there's the climate issue, I won't get into it. I think it can be managed, one has to be careful about it, but if the prices and incentives are right, I think the technologies will come forward to manage uh, the climate problem. The, the second uh, issue that came up quite a bit also at the IMF World Bank meetings uh, in the fall is the slowdown of emerging markets, and you alluded to it somewhat. And I think here one, one has to, you know, one has to, um, make the difference between the crisis period and, and the longer run. Ever since the late 1980s, the emerging markets grew at about two, two and a half percentage points faster than the advanced countries in the aggregate. During the crisis period, 2008, 2012, the differential went up to four and a half. And that, of course, is exceptional. So I don't expect the emerging markets as a whole to grow four or five percentage points faster. But I do believe that because of catch up of technology, because of uh, in Asia, large savings rate, large investment rates, and because, because of the drive of great needs, including Africa, growth in the emerging markets and the developing countries uh, can remain quite strong, I would say in the five to 6% as an aggregate. But there is one difference one has to make, and I think things will be, be it, it is not right to Having said that, one shouldn't generalize too much, just like one shouldn't generalize in advanced countries. There are those countries which have a high savings rate, a high investment rate, are not dependent on foreign capital inflows, basically emerging Asia, with, with the savings rate, if you take out China, which is a case in its own, but even excluding China, emerging Asia has a savings rate close to 30%. And then you look at Latin America, where the savings rate is more like 16, 17%. And I think there's a difference there. So the growth rate between Latin America and I think emerging Asia will be quite uh, significantly different, with Latin America growing much, much more slowly. Africa, I'm, I remain an optimist, but we'll discuss this more, uh, I think, later during the conference. I think Africa has made, 
is making tremendous institutional progress from a very difficult situation, of course, but I can easily see Africa growing at, at, at 6% or so over the next two decades. Now, in terms of the overall macroeconomic balances, the demand side of growth, rather than the long-term supply side, you yeah. know, technology and needs and so on, I do believe there is an overall problem of income distribution in the world. Uh, the most dramatic statistics are not everywhere the same, but you know, I think we've all seen the statistics that in the US, the post-crisis recovery income growth, 94% of total income growth in the US accrued to 1% of the population. Now, you know, whatever we think about this from an ethical point of view, from a political point of view, I don't want to get into that. One can have different views on income distribution and mobility, you know. But I think from a purely macroeconomic point of view, this is also a problem. Because when you don't have a much wider distribution of the benefits of growth, when everything gets concentrated at the very top, then the, the strong demand, which was the driver of growth for so many decades in the advanced countries, the healthy middle class demand is not there, it can't develop. And also there's a general sense of tension and even conflict uh, that that brings with it. So I do, I really do believe that quite apart from ethical reasons, and you know, that's a separate issue, but from the point of view of pure macroeconomics, uh, I think paying more attention to income distribution and to, to how growth is taking place and how it's spreading through societies, I think is, is very valid. I'm very happy that the President of the United States, President Obama, has put this up front in his agenda for his second term. In many speeches, I think he sees the problem, and there are many issues, of course, in the US, but I'm I'm, I am personally very happy that uh, the President of the United States is taking a leadership role on this issue. Now, the last point, and I think I will leave to my um, uh, colleagues so many, many other points, but I think in terms of global imbalances, and it was actually at the World Policy Conference last year in Cannes, that I really made this point strongly. And I remember uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was kind of, you know, uh, reacted quite, uh, quite in, a, in a very interested way. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's with us and I have great admiration for him and, uh, and so on. But I think the imbalances in the world are shifting. And China is not going to have a large current account surplus this year. Um, Germany has a current account surplus that is much higher than China's. And the Eurozone as a whole, because the adjustment happened in the southern countries, which are, have eliminated their deficit now, but the northern countries are not really contributing to the adjustment. So we, we find the Eurozone with a 260, 270 billion dollar surplus in the Eurozone as a whole. We, ha we have the Mediterranean countries trying to adjust, and they are doing it to a great degree and with some pain, and not always in the most efficient way, but nonetheless, unit labor costs in, in, in Spain, in, in Portugal, even in Greece, in, in, in Italy are falling, but the euro is appreciating. So vis-a-vis -vis the competitors outside the eurozone, you know, if I'm a Spanish enterprise or a Spanish worker, my, I'm becoming more competitive, but vis-a-vis -vis the world as a whole, because the euro, euro is appreciating, all my efforts are going to naught. Mm -hmm. So I really do believe that there is a need for adjustment within the Eurozone, and particularly Northern Europe has to contribute to that adjustment. Now, I stressed that very much last year. At this point, the European Commission, as you know, has started a procedure vis-a-vis -vis Germany looking into the German surplus. Uh, the United States Treasury has complained strongly about it. And while I admire the, you know, the, the, the sense of uh, dynamism in Germany and, and, and so on, I think that there is a real issue of economic policy. For Germany itself, I don't think it's a question of transferring resources to others. But there are huge investment needs inside Germany itself. Uh, there, there are huge things that can be done for the, for the welfare of the German people themselves, which indirectly will help others, not just by attracting imports, but also by, by having some influence on the value of the euro and, and uh, preventing too strong an appreciation of the euro, which will be very bad for Europe. So these are some of the points I wanted to start with. Thank you. You won't be surprised if I share most of what uh, Kemal has said. I'll just add a couple of things on the, uh, on the long term and maybe comment on the, uh, on the short term. 
on the long term to the factors you have mentioned, Kemal, I would add uh, demography and longevity, because I think these are two very important drivers of the growth going forward. And the, uh, the fact, as an example, that in 10 years, Africa will have 300 million people more, and that Japan will probably have four or five million less, uh, will have an impact. Longevity is still progressing, and this is potentially a very significant source of wealth creation, if well handled. So I think this is an important driver. Uh, when I look at the middle term situation, I think the situation is better, but fragile and uneven, because we have, under the appearance uh, uh, of a sort of uh, uh, decent growth, uh, very uh, powerful underlying trends, which are creating disruptions. You have mentioned the inequality in income. I think we are underestimating the impact of technology on many of the industrial sectors, but also on many of the services industries. If I look at my own industry, uh, the way both big data and digital are going to fundamentally change the landscape within the next five to 10 years is grossly underestimated, I think. So a 2% growth can dissimulate minus 20% in one sector and plus 20% in another. This is uh, within the existing economies creating risks of uh, disruption. The other thing where I agree with you is that I don't think that emerging countries are, as they were for most of the last five years, one bag with similar animals. Uh, I think you have the emerging countries which have sound balance sheets, and the ones who have more issues, either because they have a deficit in the balance of payments, or because they are slow at implementing their structural reforms. Uh, I mean, to uh, uh, mention the elephant in the room, I think most of the very large investors have been disappointed by what has happened in India over the last two, three years, because they were expecting a change at a much faster pace. Uh, if I look at uh, uh, Europe and the US, I mean, we are, as an institution, pretty optimistic about the US, because we think that the combination of uh, uh, technology uh, and energy revolution are creating a sound basis for a, a restart of the US economy, even if they find, uh, uh, sorry, especially if they find an even awkward compromise on the budget. So middle term, we are not pessimistic about the US. Uh, we are more cautious when we look at Europe, because there we think that the situation is really uneven with some countries who have really started to address their issues in terms of structural reforms, and others who are lagging behind. And uh, uh, if you look at what has been going on, I think the European Central Bank has been doing a marvelous job in trying to fix the issue now a little more than a year ago, but uh, uh, it does not dissimulate the fact that the pace of structural reforms in some of the countries is still insufficient. And I think if this doesn't change and now doesn't change fast, the risk of significant disappointment and significant disruption is lying ahead of us. And uh, uh, to a certain extent, with the central banks having not overused, but used very much the tools at their disposal, uh, the next time, if there is a very significant tension, what is going to remain in the toolbox? Uh, uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is a concern. So that's why I think middle term, we have many reasons to be optimistic, because technology, demography, flows of capital, flows of talent uh, are going in the right direction, but we should not underestimate the disruption risks on the road. The last point I would mention in terms of global governance, because this is one of the issues of this forum, is I'm very impressed by the fact that we are probably seeing a sort of end of the Vestalian states. Borders, classical borders, are becoming, becoming irrelevant in more and more areas. Uh, it's true uh, as far as, I mean, internet big data is concerned, but it's not the only place where it's true. If you look at the sources of tension in the world, what's, the dividing lines are not anymore, or many times not the borders, they are religion, uh, economic centers, I mean, complex issues, and this is going to force us to reinvent the way we look at communities, communities being as well states as uh, uh, economic uh, um, groups. 
Thank you. So uh, the states and the, the governments need to act and to uh, reform after the central bank have the central banks have done uh, uh, their job. Uh, a former central banker <laughs> will will give us uh, his view on uh, on the world economy. Uh, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here, and thank you, Thierry, for this excellent uh, program. Uh, I was introduced as a former central banker, but the good news is that the only title that nobody can take away from you is former. <laughs> uh, uh, let me share with you, before I move on, I'll share with you the trauma that I got uh, 10 minutes ago. When I came here, I told the uh, the moderator, that I have a beautiful presentation of 45 minutes. And he told me that uh, really I did not have so much time. And when I looked at the email which I received, I saw that my secretary transcribed wrongly. I was supposed to have four to five minutes opening <laughs> remarks. And here I have 45 <laughs> minutes. So uh, let me squeeze it. And if I have more time, I'll tell you what Bernard Shaw would have said about it. But I don't. Um, I will go telegraphically on several challenges for the world economy, with the hope that as we move on in the discussion, we will also discuss the solutions to these challenges. And I first want to start by sharing the atmosphere that was introduced by the first two speakers a sense of optimism. It's extremely important. And I would say we should be now optimistic, but not sanguine. And it's extremely important state of mind, because few years ago, and not more than few years ago, the atmosphere was of a doomsday, of the floor disappearing from underneath us, of a financial crisis that reflected huge uh, vulnerability. I think this is behind us. I, See here Jean-Claude Trichet, one of the heroes that uh, enabled this to happen. But we are now in a situation where there are still many challenges, but let's call them challenges rather than crisis points. First, the good news. The world is growing. You know, some of you looking at his neighbor or her neighbor say, I don't see that. But yes, the world is growing. In fact, since 2009, which is the year that we would like to forget, because the world shrunk, every year the world has been growing. So why do we feel tension? Because the center of gravity of the world has moved, and some parts of the world, especially the industrial world, particularly within the industrial world, Europe, have not been growing. But the center of gravity has changed, and that's the major drama of a mega trend. In 1990, Two-thirds of world output was produced by Japan, US, Europe. You wanted to know where the world goes, you looked at these three blocks and it's over. You knew everything. Today, only less than 45% is produced by these three. Where did it all go? In 1990, only 7% of world output was produced by China and India together. Today, more than 20%. A decade ago, from European exports, only 5% went to China. Today, more than 20%. A decade ago, from American exports, only 7% went to China. Today, 25%. What does it mean? It means that the world center of gravity is moving, that businessmen and entrepreneurs know to recognize opportunity, and yet, some policymakers are fighting each other. And indeed, the champion of free trade and opening trade had to confront, our friend Pascal Lamy, had to confront these sentiments. A decade ago, when you were talking about China and you went to Europe and the US, you would have been told that's a threat. Today, when you go to US and Europe and speak about China, you are being told that's an opportunity. That's a very, very different state of mind. Much of the focus a decade ago was about the trade between China and the US and Europe. Let me tell you, 
that volume of trade between China versus US and Europe is less than half than the volume of trade between China and the rest of Asia. That's where the action is. We need to recognize it. Second issue, Europe. Again, I spoke about the fact that Europe was a very pessimistic perspective. Today it's not. But what are the challenges? There are still several challenges. Diversity within Europe is huge. Unemployment rate in Spain and uh, Greece is more than 25%. And if you are young, it may be 50%, 60, and moving north. And unemployment in Germany is 6.9%. Imagine a conversation between the Minister of Finance of Germany and the Minister of Finance of Spain and Greece they really have different types of problems. And instead of addressing these problems, they go to the ECB. The fact is that monetary authorities have done more than can be done. And the idea is not to solve a problem, but to give breathing space to the problem so that those who can solve it can address it. And that's where the issues, structural issues. We have unemployment rate today in Europe 12.2%. Do you know how many of those have been unemployed for more than a year? More than 50% of those who are unemployed today have already been unemployed for more than a year. Additional 18% of those who are unemployed today have been unemployed for the period of between six and 12 months. It means that there are a lot of structural issues in the unemployment which requires education, which requires issues that have to do with labor mobility, etc. It is not a monetary issue. By the way, in the US, the rapid decline of the unemployment rate from what it was, more than 10% to today 7%, was not all job creation. Many of them are reflected by the fact that individuals got discouraged and left the labor force. In fact, Labor force participation in the U.S. has declined very rapidly. It was 68% a few years ago. It is now significantly less. And in Europe, the rise in the unemployment rate is because of a rise in labor force participation. Those are structural issues that money and credit itself will not solve. Macro policies. You said that the toolkit is exhausted. This is good point to have made. Because the danger is that people started to think that if interest rates are zero, we can find other policy instruments. We can find forward guidance. We can do non-conventional measures. So let me tell you, those non-conventional measures and forward guidance were very effective to reduce the extraordinary potential loss of effectiveness from zero interest rate. But let's not get used to it. It's not a place to be. As far as I know, every central banker in the world would dream that the time will come and normalcy will enable them to have a little more positive interest rate so they do not need to resort so much to non-conventional measures. But in the meanwhile, let's face it, a few years ago, all the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of America, was composed of treasury bills, very short dated government obligation of very high quality. Today, a very large proportion is what is called in the jargon mortgage-based security, which basically says those are less liquid assets which were acquired in order to solve liquidity problems in specific sectors. But again, it's not something to stay forever. Finally, let me join hand with the previous speaker about demography. If there are forecasts about the future, we all know we are very bad forecasters. But there is one forecast which is robust, demography. That's a very heavy tanker, tanker and we know what are the implications of it. In the next 20 years, the world will have population larger than what it is today by one and a half billion people. 
where are they going to be? More than 1.45 of them will be in the developing world. Only meager addition will be in the industrial countries. The industrial countries, as was described, is in some places shrinking, Japan. In all places, aging. In fact, in Japan, the only cohort that will have in 20 years more people in it is the cohort that will be 80 years plus. So if you, have to have, if you want to have more friends, you better be 80 plus. Everywhere in the world, all the cohorts are shrinking. That's terrible for the structure of innovation, structure of education, structure of community, structure of entrepreneurship, structure of dynamism. Where is it all going? In the, in the, in the developing countries. But also in the emerging countries, it's not monolithic. It was already said. China will have more population, maybe 100 million extra, but aging. Well, now the one-child policy is changing, we will see. India will have about 300 million extra with a beautiful Gaussian distribution, very healthy. And we see here the, minister, the governor from India, uh, and indeed, it's a great news. You mentioned Africa. Africa will have additional 450 million people. It will be the largest continent and the youngest continent. What is the challenge that is left? Well, of course, we know the health issues, but we see here Mr. Mo Ibrahim, who made his career in identifying the issue that connects us in this conference, namely governorship. You solve the problem of governorship, of governments. You deal with the issue of health, you have discovered the new future Africa. So when all is said together, let me conclude by saying those are challenges, they are formidable, but like all challenges, there are also opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> David Rothschild, maybe you could um, share with us in, in less than 45 minutes uh, some of your thoughts on, uh, on financial reforms. Sure. I mean, I, I, I had understood that the expose was not 45 minutes, but eight, but I'll try and keep it to four so that there's enough time for other speakers uh, and for questions. Uh, I think that there are very few topics who are so linked to both governance and, and world economy than w w what, what concerns the, 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 the banking industry. And as I have, I belong to this very popular category of being a European private banker. Uh, I think I will, I will stay on, on that subject and just make a few, a few, a few quick comments. First of all, as, as, as the previous speaker said, I think that we... We, we've covered a lot of ground. We have a lot of the acute elements of the crisis who are now behind us. Uh, banks have gone through an unbelievable ordeal uh, since 2008. Uh, most of that is behind us. And of course, governments, regulators, uh, the industry itself uh, has worked towards um, reducing uh, the, the, the risk factor around banks protecting depositors, uh, creditors, uh, taxpayers, and also, of course, hopefully still being able to uh, finance the economy, which is an important function of banks. Now, a lot of things have been done uh, in terms of, of structural modifications of, of, the, of, of the banks and in terms of governance. I mean, the, the, the main things, not to become too boring and too technical, is that uh, one has changed the, the, the equity ratio, means that banks have to have much more capital. One has changed the liquidity ratio, which means that ba banks have to be <clears throat> better funded with longer term, longer term funding, therefore probably over time slightly more expensive. And one has changed the leverage ratio, which means that the balance sheets have to be smaller. I think that when Lehman went down, the, the leverage was between 30 and 40. The Americans have, have fixed a, a leverage ratio at 5%, which means 20 times your, your shareholders' fund in terms of balance sheet. This is a fundamental change. In terms of governance, we're living in a, in a historic moment uh, because uh, two things are, are being put in place uh, within, within the Eurozone, a centralized supervision, uh, which is great, 
great because the lady who's going to run uh, the, 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 the supervision is a remarkable uh, French lady, Madame Nouy, that all of us here who are in the financial sector know well, and I think she'll do a great job. Uh, I think that obviously harmonizing, centralizing, harmonizing uh, control is extremely important because we have seen in the past lots of discrepancies between regulators on how one approaches banks. And of course, the, the banking union, which probably if, if what is in the press since a few days takes place will be, will be, will be in action by the end of this year. And the, the banking union uh, will mean that there will be a resolution mechanism, which is how are you going to treat uh, banks who are in trouble? And there will be a, 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 a sort of unified approach. Uh, obviously, the shareholders will be hurt. That is normal. I think the creditors will also be hurt, which is, which is a bit new. The depositors above 100, 000, until 100,000 euros will be protected, but those above might at some point be hurt. And of course, ultimately, governments, meaning the taxpayers. Now, all this, is it positive? One has to say yes. Does it restore uh, confidence in banks, credibility of the banking industry? I suppose yes. Now, questions obviously have to be, have to be uh, put on the table because it's not only describing the things, but also asking oneself what are the consequences of all this. First of all, it's interesting to, 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 to realize that profitability of the banking sector before 2008, uh, I mean return on equity, was something between 15% and 25%. It is now going to be something between high single digit to low double digit for the best performers. Therefore, uh, considering the constraints that have been put on the industry, profitability goes down. Now you can say two things. You can say, if you look at a bank as a utility, 9, 10, 12% return, it's a great investment, and therefore when banks need to grow and increase capital, they will find capital because they're safe. If you consider the, that there's a, a strong risk component in the bank, you may say that that sort of return is not enough, and therefore there might be an issue for the development of the banks going forward in terms of capital increase. Second question, which is directly linked in terms of, of, of what are the consequences of all this, is can they perform properly the lending job to fuel growth? It's very difficult to give a quick answer. Uh, in some countries you would say no, in other countries you would say yes. Some banks are perfectly in the position to do, some are not. It's a difficult answer, but it is a question that we will be faced with for a fairly long time. The short answer is yes, with a couple of uh, things that will need to be verified over time. Now, in 2014, there will be another round of stress tests. There will be another uh, asset quality review. So I think by the end of 2014, one will have a fairly, a fairly stable environment in all this. But what it means is that the banking sector, who's always been regulated, is very highly regulated. Now, there's nothing wrong in being regulated. But another question that comes up on the table is that there's a lot of shadow banking. Shadow banking is something very respectable. It just means banking which is not regulated. And where a lot of uh, interesting things happen in the terms of finance. Now, you would say, well, then you have to regulate uh, the, the, the shadow banking area. My own view is that too much regulation is never something that creates a lot of prosperity in the economy. Equally, the, 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 the balance between too much and too little regulation is a very tricky one because if you go too far in regulation thinking a couple of years ahead, you, you, will have, you, you, have, you face the risk of having talent transfer from regulated sector to non-regulated sector and therefore it weakens uh, the, the, the banking sector uh, as we sort of define it. So I think it's an interesting period. I think that, you know, Pascal Lamy is the expert, so it, it, it's always silly to make comments in front of an expert, but the issue about Europe is, is it too much or too little? Uh, and I think it's a combination of both. Uh, there are too many details that you don't, would, would like to see Europe not looking after, and, and, and some key factors of convergence that you would like to see in order to have a better Europe, because we're in the middle of the river, we can't go back, and therefore we've got to have a, a more Europe and a better Europe. And I think that what is happening in the banking sector uh, caters to uh, a more organized and a better Europe. 
I'll finish by one word because an investment banker can never stop a speech without selling his own shop. Now, I'm not going to sell my own shop. I'm going to say that we, 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 our main job is to help people achieve their goals, which is we advise people who want to do things, transactions, buy other people, sell, finance themselves. We even do some work for, for a lot of sovereign governments. Talking about what, what the previous speaker said, which is, are we coming into a period of improvement? Yes, I think we are. Uh, since 2008, the overall mergers and acquisition market, which is a small measure, but is, is a measure, has dropped by 25 to 30 percent uh, and has not come back yet. So it is an indication that people are more cautious, people are uh, afraid of overpaying, they don't want to sell too cheaply, that they're, they're, they're not sure to find exactly the financing they need. But slowly one can see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Thierry, for your invitation. Great privilege being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second, let, let's uh, move to uh, Asia with you and jump into these um, uh, global uh, governance issues that are key, of course, to uh, uh, the stability of the world economy. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. As always, it's a great privilege to be here with all of you and particularly distinguished the panelists sharing the, this podium. I thank you. Thank the uh, Thierry Montbrial for inviting me. Well, uh, given the time constraint, I will focus my very brief uh, comments on the global governance with spe uh, specific reference to uh, G20. But before doing so, I may follow up on the couple of points made by previous uh, speakers. Kamal Davis uh, referred to the, uh, the, the recent Larry Summers and Paul Krugman's uh, view of secular stagnation uh, to see the current state of the world economy <clears throat> from that secular stagnation perspective. The current state of world economy can be characterized as the slow growth and the uh, weak job creation. Uh, and this Larry Summers and Paul Krugman is not just as a cyclical but a, a more secular uh, stagnation uh, phenomenon. Whether you would agree with him or not, but I was uh, so it's useful uh, to pay attention to such a view from our the global governance uh, perspective, and that is that it takes stronger country level or regional level, global level policy actions, and perhaps closer policy cooperation. Second point I would like to follow up on is another point on the uh, Kamal Davis mentioned uh, global imbalance. But so far, the economists and the, we all tend to look at the global imbalances mostly in uh, macroeconomic terms and specifically in more real economic terms, real economy terms, rather than financial linkages and financial channels and financial imbalances. I think we have to pay more attention to uh, the, the global imbalances in, in, in the uh, 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 financial sector because financial stability is critically important to have the uh, real economic stability and real economic growth. So I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, full note on these two ideas. Regarding the G20, I don't think we have to get into the, the origin and this, what has been achieved by the G20, but we all know that G20, which uh, replaced the G7 by actually G7 leaders themselves, by recognizing the fact that the global economic power constellation has changed such that new global governance is needed. So G20 emerged from that perspective and thanks to G20, the global, the world uh, was able to avert another great depression. 
So the G20 leaders, so satisfied with the uh, G20's achievements, they agreed in Pittsburgh 2000, the, uh, the nine, to designate G20 as their premier forum for international economic cooperation. I emphasize this fact that G20 leaders, including G7 leaders, agreed to designate the G20 as premier forum for international economic cooperation. And they committed to it, and also they specifically agreed to have what is called MAP, Mutual Assessment Process. Unfortunately, in my view, in recent years, G20 is not living up to the, their earlier commitments and promises. You look at G7, the last G7, which was held in the UK. Look at the agenda. You will see all the economic issues back on the agenda. I just wonder, those G7 leaders have forgotten about their earlier commitments to G20. G7 alone cannot handle many of new global issues. As uh, we witnessed after the, the uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, and therefore we have to have G20 somehow reinvigorate, in, reinvigorated in this not multipolar world, no polar world, or the, uh, the, uh, in journalistic terms, it's a zero world. We need a collective leadership. The G20 can be a source of collective leadership. And so in that regard, as always, as I did last year at this uh, very conference, that G20 needs its own further institutionalization to strengthen its own governance system, to provide collective leadership, which the global community needs at this point. How to further institutionalize? Whenever, immediately I say this, some people say, well, as that is uh, proposed to uh, build a full-blown secretariat as such, you don't, have to, you don't have to go that far. You can even institutionalize further the current existing troika system. There's many different ways of doing it so that G20 can keep the, the, its own institutional memory for consistency and the continuity. Mind you, G20 summit is a not annual, annually held events. It is a process. So I would like to see this whole process is being continued throughout the years, have more frequent, more structured deputies meetings and finance ministers meetings, Sherpas meetings, and before to have the uh, summit because uh, leaders' time is the most scarce resource in the world, so they cannot meet often, but at least it is seven. Uh, deputies and the finance ministers meet more often, frequently. Look at what's considered the imminent U.S. Fed's tapering, this monetary easing. I think it ought to be brought into the G20 framework. Of course, it is U.S. domestic policy, but the potential spillover effect will be so grave, and so the the reverse spillover effect will affect the United States anyway. And therefore, it is not only good for the, the rest of the world, but good for the, uh, for the United States, should bring into the G20 framework, there is a MAP, Mutual Assessment Process, which can be technically assisted by the IMF and other multilateral institutions. So I think, Actually, in distant future, maybe p perhaps, I don't know how distant it will be, but this uh, Japanese, uh, the, the tapering time will come, and we have to expect that. And that should be brought into the, again, G20's framework. So there are a lot to be done and can be done. I know it will be difficult, but it has to be done 
in this no polar world. We need a collective leadership, functioning collective leadership. To have a functioning collective leadership, we should further institutionalize G20 itself. Let me stop here and then maybe we can look the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. To uh, go on on this, uh, on this issue, Pascal Lamy, your uh, diagnosis may be on, uh, on the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of uh, global governance and, and collective leadership, as, as uh, Il uh, Sakong said. Well, let me uh, try and follow up on what uh, Dr. Sakong just said and also uh, on what uh, Thierry de Montbrial said at the introduction of this afternoon and take, let's say, a slightly different stance. Uh, Dr. Sakong was talking about the G20 and how great it is and how much it should provide leadership. Uh, Thierry was uh, talking of global governance in terms of uh, powers, major power, uh, middle powers, uh, major middle powers. Uh, I don't think that's uh, the right intellectual framework for the future. And uh, I'm saying this after a uh, one-year uh, work uh, with a number of uh, world luminaries which were gathered on the, on the, the auspices of the Oxford Martin School, uh, major people, including a few in this room, uh, Mo Ibrahim, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, which shows that there is a connection with the uh, World uh, Policy Conference, uh, which I had the privilege to chair, and where uh, we tried uh, to uh, look at future generations and more precisely how to bridge this gap uh, between what we know of uh, challenges for the future, and we know a lot of that, and uh, the uh, very limited uh, action capacity uh, which we all uh, deploy uh, on these uh, challenges. And what we did was uh, a sort of scientific method. Uh, we looked at, let's say, 10 global issues that work reasonably well for the last decade, and 10 uh, other issues uh, which uh, failed uh, more or less mi miserably. And instead of taking this from the theoretical or philosophical point of view, we just looked at why did what work work and why did what didn't work not work? Why did HIV AIDS work reasonably well? Uh, why did uh, Y2K work well? Why did uh, ocean uh, depletion uh, not work? Uh, why did uh, financial regulation before 08 not work? Now, one of the main lessons, and I'm not going to expand on the whole uh, of the conclusions of this report, which you will find on the website of the Oxford Martin School, one of the main conclusions uh, is that uh, where it worked, when we're these issues were tackled by more or other than uh, sovereign nation states. Uh, what uh, Henri uh, called a moment ago uh, uh, Westphalian systems. Uh, and that's something which is important for the future and we tried to envisage looking at future challenges what sort of new ways of addressing this gap uh, between knowledge and action. And one of the main conclusions is that uh, you need coalitions that go far beyond normal sovereign nation state action. In a way, we need to uh, demonopolize international governance from the Westphalian system from sovereign nation states. Uh, we need uh, to look at a higher di diversity of public institutions. For instance, mega cities have in the solutions of the problems of this planet, sometimes much more power than many of the 200 uh, nation states which uh, you find around the uh, UN uh, table. Many, a growing number of multinationals 
are engaging in uh, whatever shape of a corporate social responsibility on environmental or social issues. And of course, you've got now quite a large number of global NGOs whose effective power is again often much bigger than many of the average 200 nation states on the planet. So that's one of the ways, I'm not saying it's the only one, but that's one of the ways forward in order to try and be better at, uh, in, many, in many ways, uh, moving these long-term issues uh, nearer to our uh, action capacity. Uh, one example uh, of the of <laughs> 10 or 50 proposals which uh, we make in this uh, report, and I'm, again, I'm not going to expand on them all. Uh, some are reasonably uh, innovative or uh, provocative. Is, for instance, on climate change, let's work with uh, uh, what we call a C20, C30, C40, 20 countries, 30 major multinationals, 40 mega cities. These clubs exist. There is a G20, uh, there is a, a C30 uh, by a, a number of important multinationals. There is a group of mega cities who share a lot of experience and network uh, in uh, environmental uh, issues. Now, our suggestion is that if you put the three clubs around the table, then this huge problem of global warming uh, and uh, carbon emission uh, uh, disciplines will be solved within this group. And if it is solved within this group, then the rest of the system will adjust to that. So let me leave it there and with a sort of hope, suggestion, maybe for Thierry and the organizers, that in the future uh, we share a bit of that. We look a bit at these global governance issues, not just in, and you know, I'm, I know that, and I myself have been trying to identify for a long time how this machinery can work like classical Vestalian systems, sort of post-Vestalian system. Well, I think now, uh, and that's a suggestion again for our future reflections, we should look at a Vestalian systems. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, long-term issues can be... Long-term issues can be handled and uh, very efficiently by the private sector and local authorities rather than uh, uh, sometimes more efficiently than uh, by governments. And that's interesting. Um, this is supposed to be also a discussion, so I'd like to uh, open the, the floor to uh, everyone if you, if you want to raise questions. En français ou en anglais, d'ailleurs, comme, comme vous le souhaitez. Monsieur Thank you. It's a question for all the panel. One of them is two questions. One is, what would you suggest to do in order to change the distrib distribution of the fruits of the growth? As a matter of fact, uh, one of the speakers says that 90% of the income of the United States goes to 1% of the po population. And of course, it is uh, like a bomb explosion uh, was going to be exploded between the poor people and the very, very rich people. The gaps are can become more and more large in every country in the world, especially the so growing in economy. And the fruits of the economy are not distributed to the low, uh, to the low layer of people. What would you do, suggest to do to governments how to change the distribution of money? Second, what do you think about the Bitcoin? About the? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> oh. That's you, uh, who would like to uh, <laughs> handle the issue? It's, uh, by the way, it's 95% of the increase of income has gone to the 1%, uh, the richest 1%. Very, I mean, very quickly, of course. But I think strong education and a good health system, yeah. a, a human resource system that really is equal for everybody and gives the equal opportunity to everybody is extremely important. And of course, the private sector can play an important role here, but the state has to continue to play a very, very crucial role. So I think the skill, the, the, we had some results about France the other day. And we see that despite the quite, I think, admirable egalitarian culture in, or, or philosophy in France, the actual functioning of the education system creates greater inequality. Uh, so just as an example, it's not just France. In, in the US, you have the best universities by far you know, in the world. You have fantastic institutions. 
but you now have to pay $40,000 a year, $50,000, $60,000 a year to send your children there. There's $1 trillion of student debt, and there's a large part of the school system which is really not performing at all well, and so on, and, and, and you know, so I think that's one angle. The, the other angle, and that goes a little bit to Henri's point about demography, I want to link it, is one has to rethink social policy and the social contract. I think um, the, the, the process of aging is bringing new challenges, but also, and Henri said it, new opportunities, if it's handled correctly. So one has to look at life as a, as a process where education, work, leisure, and retirement are much more dynamically linked throughout life and financed in a healthy way with an eye to equal opportunity and, and, and a greater balance in income distribution. And finally, there's a global governance side of this. I know, uh, you know nobody likes high taxes, but uh, a good tax income is needed if the state is going to, you know, if, if the communities and the state is going to deliver the social insurance and solidarity that is needed. So to have a fair tax system that, that is good for incentives but also takes enough in is important. And that, there is a global governance side to this. We've heard about multinational corporations legally, not illegally, legally minimizing the tax burden by shifting, by claiming that their intellectual property, all their intellectual property is created in Ireland and because they have a special tax deal in Ireland or things of that sort. So uh, it is hard for single countries to pursue the social policies and the economic policies that are needed for greater balance. It has to be done in a stronger international framework. Jacob? Well, I'm, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Kamel, my good friend, started with the issue of uh, education and the long-term issue. But I think that uh, what Minister Shitrit reflected was, but what do we do now? Well, uh, two things I want to emphasize. It's much, if we agree on what not to do, it is already more than 50% of the way. Because the greatest temptations for politicians is to take from those who have and transfers to those who do not have and it looks like a good social policy. And we need to be careful not to destroy the entire incentive systems of savings and investment. So that's why we need really to reconcile the fact that those who save and invest are capable of indeed keeping most of the benefits, but by the same token, those who are underprivileged know that the society allocates resources to improve their chances for the future, and that's what was discussed here before. Let me put some numbers on the last point that Kamel made. Today, if you look at the US budget, and that's what I want to look at, you take out of the budget interest payments, which is really something which is not discretionary. If you look at the US budget X interest payments, 25% goes to Social Security. Another 23, 24% goes to healthcare. And therefore, for everything else, education, infrastructure, defense, there is 52% of the budget. Fast forward 20 years. Do nothing to the regulations or to the laws. Only the effect of aging and do the same exercise. In the year 2035, which is around the corner, Social Security will still be 25% of the budget, ex-interest payments, but healthcare will be 40%, which means that for everything else, education, defense, infrastructure, there is 30-something percent. There is no way that this circle can be squared. Either citizens will recognize that they need to expect less services from the government, or will need to recognize that they have to pay for 
higher proportion of the services that they get. There is no way to find any other middle ground. Now this means, of course, we need to do either revisit the social compact between governments and their citizens, increase efficiency of use, less waste, etc., etc., but increase the pie. Not distribute the pie, but increase the pie, and that's where, again, the education comes in. Thank you. Thank you. Pascal Lamy, and then... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more on uh, Kemal's side on that, unsurprisingly. Uh, I think the fact is that inequalities are growing. The reality of globalization is that poverty is strongly reduced by globalization, but inequalities are growing. And even in systems like Europe, whose tolerance to inequality is uh, much lower than in other continents, inequalities are growing. Our social systems are regressing. In most countries, the progress that were made during the previous decades in, for instance, social mobility through education are moving back. So the answer to this distribution question, to this inequality system, is first, of course, a political, philosophical, moral, ethical, whatever choice on what's the proper level of inequality. And I happen to say or think that it's not only a moral issue, there is also an efficiency issue. I think, personally, more equalitarian societies are more efficient than less equalitarian societies. I know other people believe differently. But it's a question of how can you concretely improve access to health, access to education, access to housing, access to culture. And that's not only a tax system. It's a really a question of reprocessing a number of social services, a number of public services, in order to make sure that this access is wide for those uh, who, at the origin of their life, uh, cannot exceed the proper level in order to develop themselves. Maybe one or two points quickly. Uh, many times, excessive accumulation is due to the lack of transparency and the lack of competition. So rather than using taxes, thinking about the way you can increase transparency and competition, is sometimes, I think, a better way. Uh, second thing, I think uh, uh, inequalities are less acceptable when the pie is not growing fast enough. When the, pie, when the pie is growing fast, it may widen for a while, but it's probably more acceptable. And I think the issue we have in many of the European countries is the fact that the pie is not growing anymore, which is making it less acceptable. Uh, I have a big reluctancy in seeing uh, taxes as the remedy. Uh, the city in the US where the Gini coefficient is the lowest is Detroit. Uh, does it mean it's a model? I'm not sure. Uh, as far as bitcoins are concerned, uh, it's going to be a long time before they become an asset class for insurance companies, <laughs> at least for us. But, but I think they are revealing one thing, uh, and, and maybe it's uh, uh, slightly caricatural, but in a world where inter interest rates are artificially depressed for savers, the uh, look for fancy alternative and sometimes way too exotic asset classes is increasing and it's dangerous. In second. Well, in response to, in response to the, uh, uh, what can you do about the uh, uh, income distribution and the uh, uh, governance? Well, I think the, this polarization issue and the income uh, distribution issue will be with us in coming years and decades. That is because of the acceleration, the accelerating globalization and the uh, 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 deepening knowledge society. Of course, the, these two trends have so many the merits, and therefore we are all for it. However, the downside is when these two big trends marry together, 
produce this polarization issue and the uh, uh, worsening income distribution. I think this, the polarization problem and distribution problem is not specific to any specific countries. It's a, a global, of course, in, 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 to a different extent. How can you deal with it? I think in the short term, tax and many other things, as uh, previous speakers pointed out. But I think this, the real fundamental solution should be found in, in the educational system reform, training and retraining in the short term and in the long For example, four-year college. As soon as you graduate in four-year college, you, what you learn from school can become obsolete in very uh, uh, fast uh, 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 time. So I think this education system itself has to be reformed so that the people can get re-educated on a continuous basis, not in taking extension program in the evenings, no. So I think this is the fundamental approach we should take. A at the same time, I think particularly I'm referring to the uh, emerging economies, the, the strengthening so social safety net is a must. Of course, uh, as much as they can afford, that is important. But this, I think this education can't be overemphasized in this regard. And the second point, what can you do? You know, I think this Jacob Frankel uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think it was Milton Friedman said a long time ago, it takes crisis to implement a reform. The, the G20 came about uh, because of the crisis and the global community had a sense of urgency. So they uh, came up with G20. And then as sense of urgency receipts, now they, now uh, the, there's no unity or uh, the, the leadership within the G20. So how can you then, I mean it's collective leadership, someone has to gather the leadership within the collective leadership forum. So someone has to take leadership. I think, uh, for example, the Australia, will be chair country next year. I think we'll do uh, as much as it can, and I, I think we can expect much there. But uh, it takes G7 countries a particular cooperation there for the sake of the, uh, the future of global uh, the community, uh, having, uh, by providing uh, enough collective leadership for the provision of necessary public goods the world needs. Thank you, sir. Okay. I'd like to, to make three comments on. I think one of the issues is not necessarily income distribution, but the issue of fairness. <laughs> Income distribution may, may become more skewed, but if people get a sense of fairness in society, that's fine. And this is the big issue. When markets are rigged, when big companies do not pay their due, do not pay taxes, then we have a huge challenge. And this is an issue which has to be addressed. Secondly, it's the issue of the international regime, which was raised by um, our friend from, from uh, South Korea. This is a, this is a real issue about the international regime and decision-making process. And last but not least is, okay, the financial sector, it may be improving, but there is, there is the issue of overfinance. Jack Lew, I mean, the, the, he, he made a very recent statement on, 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 in this regard. What should be done about downsizing finance? Because over, oversized finance, it's a destabilizing factor in itself. What should be done about it? After, maybe you can take another question. Yes, sir. We only have a, a few minutes yeah. left, so. Ah. Or the. Donc, uh, and je voulais juste uh, faire oui. un commentaire. Je trouve que effectivement, uh, c'est très intéressant uh, de parler de tous les problèmes uh, internationaux. Je trouve ça formidable. Effectivement, le G20 est aussi euh, un, un groupement qui permet effectivement de discuter de tous les problèmes internationaux. Et il y a un vrai problème de gouvernance que, que vous avez soulevé, et ça c'est vrai. 
Mais il y a le problème aussi de la dichotomie entre nos réflexions et ce qui se passe au niveau du gouvernement, qui ne sont pas for forcément en cohérence, puisque nous sommes toujours dans des clivages et que les, les choses n'avancent pas. Donc c'est effectivement pas forcément un problème de distribution de, de, de richesses, mais surtout d'une restructuration fondamentale à faire, euh, et donc de bousculer les systèmes dans lesquels nous, nous, nous avons euh, évolué depuis, euh, depuis des années, et qu'aujourd'hui, effectivement, de nouvelles émergences arrivent, il ne faut pas en avoir peur, mais au contraire, euh, c'est eux qui vont nous permettre peut-être de nous remettre en cause, et il est temps justement que les réflexions eh bien, euh, que nous avons aujourd'hui eh bien, fasse que des réformes en profondeur euh, soient, soient entreprises et que, des, et que des, 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 des réflexions telles que qu'on connaît aujourd'hui pendant trois jours eh bien, soient multipliées par des ateliers où les, où les pensées puissent un peu euh, se concrétiser pour, qu y ait, pour que les politiques arrêtent de nous parler euh, une langue de bois. Merci. Sir OK. Uh, no, I think the issue of inequality has not really been dealt with uh, comprehensively. Uh, we talk about, uh, instead of redistributing, let us increase the buy. But what is the point of increasing the buy? We increase the buy hugely over the last 30 years. But if most of that went to the top 1%, then what's the point of increasing the buy? What happened actually? There is a serious redistribution of wealth over the last 30 years. And just think of Bush taxation and how much over is it one and a half, two trillion dollars he gave to the top one percent. And that was supposed to be temporary measure and is going on now. When the top one percent captured the Tea Party and the Tea Party captures the Republic. Republican Party, and the Republican Party cap captured the Congress, you end up in a very opaque situation. When the salaries of the chief executives in the US, according to the Financial Times, are equal now to 450 times the average salary of people working for them, there is a question to be asked. In the UK, it's about 300 times. Europe is almost 200 times. People have redistributed already the cake over the last few years because these numbers far exceed what was there before. So there is an issue here. Uh, people have redistributed. And then when we come and talk about distribution, say, no, 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 don't distribute the cake because, you know, let us grow it. But you guys have rechanged the ratios. And then any growth coming in the future going to the top 1%, which is not right. What I feel is there have been a moral issue, actually. And I am one of the people who maybe sometimes I regret the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because <laughs> the Soviet Union created a pressure on us to behave. There was a model there about equality, rightly or wrong. And that put a lot of pressure on us to really behave reasonably on these issues why things started to go downhill since that pressure has gone away. Because we believe now we are the masters of the universe, we are impeccable, and we went on, and all this mess created uh, really by the way we redistributed wealth, where we had new masters of the universe, and I think that situation needs to be dealt with. If we are not gonna deal with it, there's gonna be another Lenin rising out of his tomb, by the way. So. We, we better behave before it gets too bad. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> we, we were supposed to, to, to finish at five. It's five past five. Uh, so one, one last uh, comment, maybe, and, uh, and then... Uh, well, this will obviously be something continued on other panels. But this panel was on macro policies, harmonization, good governance, and all well and good. But of course, at least history suggests often it's micro, it's micro policy reforms, transportation deregulation in the United States brought the railroad industry, a totally bankrupt industry into viability. Competition has made some city states in America do much, much better than other city states, and some states do better than other states in the United States. And 
there seemed to be a feeling that if we only had harmonization, then we would have a better world. Harmonization is the enemy of competitive mm. pressures to ensure that policies make sense. I think the policies, and I guess the rest of the panel today will be talking about that, but harmonization, when you hear the term harmonization, I think you should reach for your revolver. Thank you. One last comment maybe from uh, some of the panelists. Uh, and if not, I see Thierry who is demanding that we uh, stop now. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Um,